What's up, everybody? Welcome to Cult of Collectors with a new episode. We are with Adam, who is the director of Jason Goes to Hell. That is what he's mainly what we all know him for. I mean, it's a part of this beautiful box set that a lot of us collectors got. So, uh, yeah, welcome to the show. And of course, always with John Low IQ Media. It is Hello, great everybody. being here with you guys. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Absolutely. We My really, pleasure. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. John's more of the behind the scenes kind of guy. So he definitely has some questions for you. I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, that box set is badass. It's, uh, it's a pretty amazing box set. Do you have your own? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible, actually. Nice. Yeah. When it when it came out, I never seen so many po people posting that they had got it. It's like one of the most bought box sets I've ever seen in yeah. physical media. I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And also, I thought it was amazing that you know they stood by it to such a degree that you know when there when there were the few errors that were found, mm -hmm. um, you know, on my disc, on part ten and on part three. Um, all you had to do was contact them. They immediately sent you the replacement discs. Didn't even ask you back for the other discs for the ones that they had. Originally yeah. Here. Arrow um, did that with Donnie Darko. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh. no, it was pretty cool to see them stand behind the, the materials. So, um, so strongly. Oh, someone's asking how you, how they're asking how you are. <laughs> oh, I'm good. I'm I'm very well, actually. Thanks for asking. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really good. I mean, other than, you know, us having a strike that uh, we don't see any end, end in sight for. Everything else mm -hmm. is pretty amazing. All right. So um, are you like all over the place when it comes to like studios or are you set with one studio? No, I were, I'm, I'm, I've always been freelance. Uh, right after Jason Goes to Hell, um, I was given a three picture deal at New Line. And then Ted Turner bought New Line. Uh, oh. and, and basically said there'll be no more horror at the studio which is oh. hilarious yeah it's hilarious for the for the studio that freddie built i was um, about to say yeah yeah he he wanted to make things like gods and generals like he was really into civil war epics and and so they stopped making horror films and started making civil war epics that did end that period of time ended oh, of um, course line. yeah because you know it, it couldn't sustain itself the, the studio was making no money so um, but no, I've, I've always been a guy who goes from studio to studio and then I've got my own production company, um, where I do most of my work now. Is that, that skeleton crew pro thing? That's us. That's no. crew. nice. Yep. yep. Yeah. I actually, uh, found your profile from a fellow, uh, Instagrammer friend, mm -hmm. you know, he's a YouTuber as well. His name's Brendan Mitchell. He had a picture with you. Um, cause he met you, I guess. It's e it was either a convention or a signing of some sort, something okay. like that. Okay. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, that's the director? So I, I, he had you tagged in the comment, and I was like, oh, let's try to get him, see if he wants to join. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's, uh, uh, yeah, we're, right now I'm in sort of like a season of really doing um, a, a lot of interviews because of, uh, we're doing, we're producing the, documentary about the making of jason goes to hell right now hearts of darkness the making of the final Fight. nice yeah yeah yeah. so that's going to be out later this year for the 30th anniversary what? um yeah so it's uh no that's been been really cool so i've been hitting the convention circuit a lot i was just at monster palooza last month mm -hmm. um you know so trying to i'm going to be running all over the country showing the film and talking to the fans and and we're going to be at a lot of festivals with it as well so now i'm I'm forgetting. Was Kane Hodder your Jason? He damn right he was. Okay, yeah. Because certain ones I forget he was in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kane was seven, eight, nine, and ten. That's substantial. Seven, eight, nine, and ten. So he's actually yeah. takes Manhattan. That's one of my favorites too. Oh, yeah, yeah. It takes Manhattan, uh, New Blood, and uh, an X. Yes. Yeah. All That's fun movies. That is Kane. <laughs> well, I like he's how amazing. you. I like how you incidentally kind of started the Jason versus Freddie thing too. Yeah. You talked mm -hmm. about how that, that was like an accident that you, when you threw that in the movie, well, I mean, yeah. it wasn't an accident you put it in the movie, but it was the accident that you didn't know that they were kind of wanting to go that direction. Nope. Nope. Yeah. They, they did not ask for that. That was not a studio note or anything like that. I, I just, I was putting in all these Easter eggs into the film. Oh, okay. 
because of that, I was sitting around with my, my, my two roommates. Um, one was my co-writer on the movie, and the other one was one of the editors on the film, who happened to be Sean Cunningham's son, Noel Cunningham. We've been best friends since we were eight years old. And, uh, and my roommates were getting stoned to the bejesus, and I was not. <laughs> Uh, cause I had to finish making the movie. Of course. And of course. <laughs> and, uh, and I was trying to figure out like where, you know, what other cool, you know, in jokes, in gags can I put in the movie and how, how much more connectivity can I have? Yeah. And I suddenly was like, wait a minute, doesn't new line own Freddie outright? Like, isn't it theirs entirely? And it was. Yeah. And I said, I know who's going to drag Jason to hell at the end of the movie. Cause they had just done Freddie's dead the year before. And I was like, Okay. You yeah, gotta have Freddie pull him down. There you and go. And I called up my two executives, Mark Rodesky and Mike DeLuca, and uh, woke them up in the middle of the night. Had this great idea. I said, "Can I? Can I have the glove in Freddie's laugh?" And they were like, "What do you want it for?" And very suspect. And I told <laughs> them, I told them what I wanted the ending of the movie to be. They could not have been more supportive. And nice. the, very, the very next day, a guy showed up on my set. Uh, uh, with the glove in a uh, locked box. It was quite something. So it was actually Bob Shea's glove that hung in his office. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, because um, were you kind of setting it up to where you wanted to do the directing of that Freddy versus Jason? Well, what happened was right after Jason Goes to Hell happened, Dean Laurie and I both pitched New Line. They brought us in because they wanted us, they wanted to know what kind of movie we would make. Yeah. And so we had a we had a really good take on the movie. It was really good. Um and fun and uh way gorier than what ended up getting made. Yeah. And, um and they uh New Line loved it. And then Wes Craven came in and was like, look, and by the way, I, I was raised I was raised in the Cunningham household. Yeah. So Wes Wes Craven was Uncle Wes. Oh, so nice. I've, I've known Wes since I was a little boy. And so um, Wes Craven came in and said, look, I have an idea for a new nightmare movie and I want to do new nightmare. Mm -hmm. And new line said, I guess we got to put a pin in Freddy versus Jason because Wes wants to do another Freddy movie. So mm -hmm. they went to do that. And then things got really messy and it took 10 years for that movie to get made. So yeah. by, that point, by that point I had moved on, Dean had moved on. We were, you know, he was doing TV shows. I was doing other films. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, not going to happen. And, and honestly, you know, for me, look, I, I think Freddie versus Jason is terrific, but I, I think the one thing that, that I will stand by on that movie that, that, that pisses me off as a fan yeah. um, and as somebody who made a Friday 13th movie, you know, there's all this, you know, um, right, rightly so protection of Robert Englund around the part of Freddie, which they should, because he is, Freddy Krueger. Um, yeah. You know, when when they tried to get you know an incredible actor to jump in and play Freddy, um, uh, Jackie Earl Haley's amazing, but the audience rejected it, and I yeah. guess why because you know Robert Englund is Freddy. Yes, and he from, is. And for my money, you know, Kane had spent you know the better part of a decade playing Jason by that point. Yes, he did. And he, you know, I, I you would be tough to find. Uh, a large swath of fans that don't say that, you know, Kane is their favorite Jason. Everybody says Kane is their favorite Jason. Yes. Um, every convention I end up going to with Kane, you know, Kane's line is around the block a couple times just to, you know, <laughs> come and meet him and have him threaten you and sign your thing. Um, Put you in a headlock too. <laughs> and so I, I find it, um, I find it incredibly disrespectful that Kane did not end up playing Jason in that movie. I think it's ridiculous. And you know, I agree. I, and I, you know, and I know, I know Ronnie, you had not seen, had not, he, he didn't like the Friday 13th films. Like he was very vocal about that. He was not a fan huh. of those movies. Um, I still thought it was incredibly disrespectful of the audience to say, Hey, we're not going to give you, we're not going to give Jason the same respect we gave Freddie. So oh, yeah. I think that's kind of gross. I can agree with that. Yeah. Cause, um, I'd be all up for a new Freddy versus Jason, like a new oh, yeah. revamp of it. Like, oh, yeah. Because everybody's doing the reboots and remakes and all that kind of stuff. Requels like, and requels and yep. Yeah, all that stuff. So, and I know that Robert England at one point said that he wouldn't mind doing one more right. as Freddy, but right. it's like, well, then let's him let him go out with an actual good bang then as Freddy with another rendition. 
I agree. And look, you know, you know, Kane and and Robert are good friends, and so I know those dudes would would love to work together again. Oh yeah, you know, I agree. Um, Kane actually, um, in the documentary that's coming out, Kane uh, makes fun of Robert a couple times. It's pretty funny. It's pretty great. <laughs> it's pretty great. Maybe you should pitch again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's. Uh, the powers that be now are are so vast. There are so many people involved in this franchise now, and now yeah. that, you know now the lawsuit has been settled. Yeah, um, it, it would be working for some pretty dubious folks. Oh, okay. um, so yeah, wouldn't wouldn't be a great experience for whatever writer director ends up on that movie. So yeah, yeah, I. I, I um, I love making that. I love making Jason Goes to Hell. I love that movie, and I'm still very proud of it. But I, I, I know how tricky it is now that horror is such big business. Because when I when I was making Jason Goes to Hell, mm -hmm. horror was still treated like porn. Yeah, and we were not we were not considered important filmmakers. We were not in, considered that we were doing something great. Now horror, everybody wants to do horror. Like horror yeah. is the thing. But it was not that way in the early '90s. That's for sure. Oh, uh, definitely. Yeah, we were the we were the idiot stepchildren. You know, um, not allowed to uh, to come to the big boy table. So, um, so yeah, I think that uh, it, it would be a tricky thing, especially if you're dealing with with Jason and with Freddie. Yeah, because there's a lot of people, a lot of um, people who protect those two entities. Yeah, and that's as a filmmaker that is hard to deal with. I mean, look on my movie alone, all I had was Sean Cunningham, right? Yeah, that was the only one I had to deal with, and Sean was like a dad to me growing up. And I can tell you, like working with Sean was a nightmare. Really? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the day I got the job, he told me I could have the job as long as I got the fucking hockey mask out of the movie, quote unquote. <laughs> Oh, so like instead of it being Jason the whole time, it was that little creature. Well, it was. I mean, we never really, we never really thought of it as a creature. We, we that was the end of the movie, so that we could. So we had a plot plot device to get, um, so we get Jason into a body and make him Jason again, which was what I wanted to do. Um, but no, Sean hated the mask. He thought the mask was stupid. Hmm. He's well, always thought the mask was stupid. Speaking of wet movie one, he actually just chimed in in the chat. Brendan. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, that's awesome. What boys? Yeah. Adam is one of the coolest guys. And then he. Oh, that's very sweet. Then he that's says it was amazing cool. meeting him at Monster Palooza. That's Monster awesome, Palooza. dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, he's, he's chatting. Yeah, I can't wait to watch the Jason Goes to Hell documentary. And nice. He actually got to see uh, Brendan got to see a little bit of the. Uh, we were showing four minutes of footage at the uh, Monster Palooza. At Monster Palooza, yeah. So it was, it was pretty cool. So people people there got to see a little bit of a sneak peek. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, because yeah. I know that there was that um, recent, I guess you could say, uh, making of Pennywise or something like that. that yes. just yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's yeah. cool. I like stuff like that. I've got yeah, I've got a really cool um I've got a great director on this movie and a great editor and really when you're making a documentary, you know, you collect all this footage. We collected over 100 hours of interviews and all the, yeah, it's a crazy amount of stuff. Um I mean, my interview alone <laughs> on the movie, we we I was in front of camera for 12 hours. Damn. So <laughs> Really, it's like it's exhaustive. And so when you when you have a director on a doc, they have to have a vision for what the documentary is. They have to really see what the shape of that movie is going to be. And then you have to have an editor who can go through that hundred hours of footage and help to create the shape of that movie and tell a good story. Yeah. And so, you know, I got this guy, Michael, uh, Mike, uh, Michael Felsher. Michael is. Um, it's a brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, he was George Romero's personal documentarian for 15 years <laughs> um, before he died, before he passed away. So that's yeah. kind of amazing. And then this guy, Eric Beatner, who has been one of my best friends since I was 14 years old. And he's a 10-time no uh, Emmy-nominated editor for The Amazing Race and Fear Factor. And he's like this absolute genius in uh you know behind the editing uh, uh screen and so 
these two these two gentlemen really are the ones who crafted this movie into what it is so um, you know, I produced the film and my company produced the film. And, you know, so my partners, Deborah and Brian, um, and myself put that together, but really, you know, and a, and a wonderful woman named Ali Rivera, who, who was the other producer on the movie, but it's these guys who really crafted a film. I can't wait for people to see it. It's, it's so fun and funny and really sweet. It's a, it's a really cool movie. It's cool. What it, By the way, tons, tons of behind the scenes footage from, <laughs> uh, from K and B. Nice. Um, yeah, that they gave us. They gave us, I think, like twelve hours of behind-the-scenes footage that no one has ever seen. What did Brendan say? Michael is a friend of mine. What? Oh, uh, good. great dude, Rich. At yeah, Red Shirt Pictures. Huh. Yeah. Okay. And it looks like one of our friends joined us too. <laughs> hey, guys. hey how you doing? Nice to see you. Yeah, our friend Jody usually is with us, and he wasn't able to make it tonight because uh, they're going to be moving and a whole bunch of stuff, sure. and apparently their baby, hopefully gets better soon, was uh, diagnosed with COVID. Oh, man. Yeah. Dad. Well, my best wishes. I was, um, Likewise. I was kind of going to ask you, um, Yeah, kind of where did you, because I've read about how you got your start a little bit, but mm -hmm. I want you to kind of talk to talk to the audience a little bit about it i did sure. see that you had um you had done a lot of plays like i guess when you're a teenager yeah and yeah. um and uh i was thinking well you're kind of like wes anderson because you can see his <laughs> you can right. see off his film mate his um play experience totally. and his movies but mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. i see that you got your start that way as well leading up to uh, johnny zombie uh, my boyfriend's back kind of like yeah. Lee, Kind of talk us through that period of time. In your sure, life. sure, sure, sure. Um, well, I, I look. I you know I grew up in a family of uh, mostly performers, um, but everybody was sort of in the business. Um, my I had two kind of famous uncles actually. Uh, one, my uncle Joe Ellison, was the writer, director, producer of Don't Go in the House, um, the nineteen eighty one horror classic, and uh, my uncle Ned played Eddie in The Burning. Um, Ned oh, okay. Okay. So Ned Eisenberg, who passed away last year, we lost. Yeah. Um, May yeah. rest in peace. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Um, he was, uh, he was really important guy to me. He was, he was, uh, not just my uncle. He was, he was a very close friend and I, I adored the guy, but, um, anyway, uh, he, he, he was, um, you know, he did, I don't know, 40 movies and he did oh, uh, just on law and order, almost a hundred episodes of law and order. Um, oh, nice. So, yeah. He was one of those guys that like, he was a, that guy, he was a New York, that guy, everybody knows him. They don't know. His yeah. name, but they know who he is. <laughs> and like, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so, so we, uh, so, you know, uh, I had them, my brother, Kip uh, played Kip Cleaver on the new leave it to beaver series for five years uh, for Disney channel and for TBS. So, mm -hmm. You know, my mother was a singer, so I had all these people, and I grew up in a little town called Westport, Connecticut, right outside of Manhattan, about 40 minutes outside of Manhattan. Okay. And uh, and so I went to a high school, a public high school, where the high school had been built around an existing theater, right? There was a student mm -hmm. theater. And the Doors played there. Um, Jimi Hendrix had played there at one point. So it was like a, it was a, you know, legit theater. Yeah, And so they built the high school around it and that theater, we made so much money doing plays there through the high school that it paid for the football team. Nice. We paid for all the sporting programs rather than the other way around. Usually it's yeah. the arts. This was the arts completely paying for everything else. Yeah. So, you know, right up the street from where I grew up, Paul Newman lived there. Um, I used to sing at Martha Stewart's house for Christmas Eve parties Martha um, Stewart. Yes. Yes. Yeah, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and so by the time I was 15, I had created my first theater company. And so I started teaching as well when I was 15. So the money that I made as a theater director, producer, choreographer ended up putting me through film school at NYU. So that's okay. how I made my way. Oh, okay. Um, so I went to NYU. I made a movie there called So You Like This Girl, which ended up winning, uh, swept the, the NYU Awards the, um, and was nominated for the Student Academy Award. And um, it, it, again, really like 
incredible group of actors and people that I got to work with. Um, I don't know if you guys ever watched Reno 911. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so officer, officer Dangle, the, um, the, the guy with the, the yes. mustache, yeah. and shorts, he's the greatest yeah. show, Tom Lennon. He was the lead yeah. of my student film in college. Oh, that's really? Awesome. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And then if you ever watch Brooklyn nine, nine, yes. uh, Andy Samberg's partner, Joe Latruglio, um, the, uh, the kind of short guy, dark hair, big eyes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He, he was the other lead of the film. Oh. And the girl in the movie, who at the time was my girlfriend, uh, ended up being the co-writer and director of Can't Hardly Wait and Josie and the Pussycats. Never oh, happened. nice. Oh, no. So yeah. I had this crazy cast, right? Yeah. And <laughs> so the, movie, the movie wins all these awards, and I get two job offers right out of school. One is to write for season two of Twin Peaks. So David Ooh. Lynch and Mark Frost offer me that. No. And the other job I was offered was to go and work for Sean Cunningham, who I'd worked for as a teenager. That's where yeah. I learned all my film practice. Um, and he said, look, you come to L.A., you be my bitch for a year. Uh oh, John. Give you oh, what is that? <laughs> go ahead, John. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. The best. <laughs> the absolute best. Um, so he said, be my bitch I've for a year and I'll give them. you your shot. Awesome. That's a better cover. That's a great cover. Yeah, that's a great cover. <laughs> Oh yeah. So we ended up. Um, I ended up coming to LA. Uh, I had three hundred bucks in my pocket and no driver's license because I'd been living in New York for the last four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had three hundred bucks that I bought a car with that I couldn't even drive, but I lived in the car. Um, and I, I was Sean Cunningham's slave. And I had brought this script that my best friend in, in college, a guy named Dean Laurie, had written called uh called johnny zombie oh okay and i wanted johnny zombie to be my first feature that was my dream was to make this movie and it was you know it was a horror comedy musical yeah so it, it fed into my love of horror but it also you know touched on a lot of the things that i did as a young person in theater because i i was a big musical theater director and so uh i I brought the script. I, I wanted to shop the script because I didn't want to wait a year to, you know, and, and be Sean's slave for all this time. Yeah. So I was thinking, how do I speed this up? How do I get Sean to say yes? Right. I didn't want to hand him the script and go, this is the movie I want to make. I, no. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, I knew psychologically that would not work. So what I did was um, I had a lot of friends in catering in LA and I got them to, um, to sneak me into charity events. Oh, okay. So I would show up in a full tuxedo to these events. Uh, I would ask uh, women that I knew were powerful that could maybe help me to yeah. dance. And then I would pitch my movie. So um, <laughs> Roger That's Corman and his wife, Roger Corman oh. and his wife were, um, were in a contest to see who could make the fastest, cheapest movie. And I was like, <laughs> sign me up. So... <laughs> I, I go out, I ask her to dance. We get on the dance floor and I'm a pretty good dancer. It's kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, she starts asking me about myself and we're just having a lovely time. And, uh, yeah. and I tell her that I'm a film student and I just graduated NYU and I won all these awards. And she was like, Oh my God, what are you, you know, what are you doing in LA? I said, well, I'm trying to put this movie together. I'm working for Sean Cunningham. The minute I knew I dropped Sean Cunningham's name, I knew whatever it is I'm talking about, she's going to want to steal it from Sean. Oh, okay. So I pitch her Johnny Zombie. She loves it. Loves the pitch. Totally into it. Great. I then leave. She says, get me a copy of the movie. Like, get me a copy of the script. So I was like, mm -hmm. I, get, I, will, I will deliver it personally to your office tomorrow. Done. I then get out of that dance. I run to Sean, to Noel's house. I tell Noel, Sean Cunningham's son. I say, hey, dude. I tell him the story that I just told you. Knowing yeah. full well, the first phone call he's going to make is to his dad. Huh. The next morning, I'm in the offices and I'm making a photocopy of the screenplay of, of, <laughs> of Johnny Zombie. And uh, Sean walks in, sees it on my desk, goes, what's that? I said, eh, it's a movie that I want to make. He grabs it off my desk, walks into his office, slams the door. Wow. About 90 minutes later, I hear, Marcus! So I come running to his office. Uh, by the way, if I sound like uh, the Batman supervillain, the Penguin, when I'm doing an impression of Sean Cunningham, 
it's because Sean Cunningham is the Batman supervillain, the Penguin. Just letting you know. So I rush into his office and uh, and he says, uh, "All right, so I hate this script, but I love the title. So I'm going to give you a million and a half. You'll go shoot it in Connecticut." And I was like, "What am I doing now? Like, is what?" That's and he says. Right he said, the only thing is that uh, I hate the writing, so I'm going to fire the writer, and I'm going to bring in a writer. I'm going to bring in a real writer. And I said, then I'm not going to sell it to you. And he was, yeah. like, he was like, wow, the ball's on you. I was like, well, <laughs> I said, look, uh, he's a brilliant writer. I said, do this. Fly him out to L.A., put the two of us up in the cheapest, shitty motel you can find, and give us six weeks to rewrite. Give us what the Writers Guild period is to rewrite. And we'll rewrite whatever you want to do. We'll do it. Yeah. And if, we, and if you still don't like it after that, then you can hire another writer. Okay. And, and he, he fell for it. He totally did it. I was shocked. He, he flew Dean out, um, put the two of us up in the Holiday Inn on Sunset in the 405. And uh, we wrote for six weeks. And ended up with a really, really fantastic script that he loved. Oh, huh, okay. So he was like, look, um, I love the script. I want to get this done. He says, but it's it's really good. We need to get more money. I don't want to do it for a million and a half. I want to, I want to get you more money, Adam. I said, great. I love more money. More money is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, uh, problem is, I don't know what studio is going to go for this because it's such an odd movie. Mm -hmm. And so... I said, well, instead of getting anybody to try to read this script, because here's the thing, the, the, the big problem in Hollywood, the big trick in Hollywood, nobody reads. Nobody reads. What happens is executives hire film school graduates who are like 22 to 25 mm -hmm. and have them read it and then write these awful like cliff note book reports on it called coverage. Yeah. And depending on whether a 22-year-old film, stu film school student likes your script, you might get somebody higher up the chain to read it or read their book report at the very least. Yeah. So I said, look, instead of having them read the script, why don't we read it to them? He was like, what? I said, listen, I'm a theater guy. Sean was an ex theater guy. Sean was a, a Broadway stage manager. I'm like, why don't we get a cast of actors and invite studio executives to a table reading of mm -hmm. the piece with some great actors. Let's really advertise it as a show, and they're getting a free ticket to the show. Okay. So he's like, I love that idea. I was like, okay, <laughs> we had these incredible casting directors. So when we did our readings of Johnny Zombie, I had, this is no joke, I had three Tony Award-winning actors at the table. Nice. I had the original Sweeney Todd from Broadway sitting at our table. I, oh. had, I had Charlotte Ray, Mrs. Garrett from The Facts of Life was reading this. Wow, story. that's cool. Um, I had an amazing cast, yeah. but the person who played Johnny, this is the best part, the person who played Johnny was the guy who had lived next door to Dean and I for the last three and a half years when we were at NYU. Mm -hmm. um, Adam Sandler played Johnny. That was... <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so... So, and this is about two weeks before he got hired uh, to do Saturday Night Live. So I was about to ask, yeah, if it was, was, he was. He was in L.A. trying to get work, you know, trying to do it was like his remote control days there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, I, and by the way, I knew all the people on remote control as well. So we were, Adam and I knew each other for years during, during school. So, uh, so he came out, he played the role. Nice. Um, and we ended up in a bidding war between New Line and Disney. And I begged Sean, I mean, I begged him, please let us shoot this movie with New Line. New Line's the right place. They're totally going to understand the kind of movie I want to make. They're that oh, kind yeah. of place. Yeah, Disney was basically gave us three times the amount of money that New Line would have given us. And Sean, Sean loves money. Well, well yeah. Loves <laughs> money. Sean Cunningham, <laughs> Sean Cunningham hates the Friday 13th franchise. Hates it has no respect for it, doesn't understand why people like it. He is, he does not get it. He loves the money it makes. Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's it. Sean is not a horror guy. Sean is a guy who is a bit... By the way, he's a fantastic producer. As a line producer, you could not find better. The guy is really, really good. 
Um, he's a he's yeah. not fun to be around, but he's very good at his job, right? <laughs> well, I mean, a good producer, you want somebody that loves money. With, without a doubt, yeah. <laughs> I I had look. We were That's talking cool. before before we started tonight. We, uh, uh, John and I were talking about you know how he's in Kentucky, and my producing partner now, Brian Sexton, who's been my producing partner for fifteen years. Brian is um, Brian is from Kentucky, is from Lexington, and he loves money. He loves money, but <laughs> but he loves story. Okay, and yeah. We, and we have a rule. Our company has one rule, and it's it, and we never bend it, yeah. which is all three managing partners have to love the script before. Oh, of course, yeah. Animated. Well, let me tell you something. Sean didn't have to love a script. Sean had to love a paycheck. So Disney comes in, gives us all this money. We go to our first <laughs> meeting at Disney. And they say to us, I'm not kidding. They're like, we love this film. We want to put it on a fast track to a green light and get this thing made. We only have one note. And we were like, okay, bring it on, man. What's the note? We've been working for a half a year on this movie. Love it. And they said, yeah. Could you get rid of the zombies? What? <laughs> and we're like, but it's called John, John Zombie. Zombie. <laughs> they said, yeah. Could he seem, I don't know, like less dead and more like tired? Oh, wow. <laughs> so I went back to Sean's office. I said, look, I said, they're going to make a $9 million a movie out of this. There's no way they're going to let a 22-year-old kid direct this thing. It's never going to happen. Yeah. I said, I said and they're, they are, they are cutting the balls off this movie. I don't want to make this movie. I don't want to make this. This is a disaster. Yeah. I said, so I just made you a shit ton of money. Give me a movie. Yeah. And he said, right. boy, he said, boy, do you got balls? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> Give me a movie. Cajones. <laughs> he said, all right, New Line is buying Jason Voorhees from Paramount. And if you can get that fucking hockey mask out of the movie, I'll let you write and direct it. What and, what was his reasoning kind of behind that? I would like to know because I don't sure. think you go into it in the in the documentary I saw you, you, um, know, you they, did. We, we go into it in the documentary that's coming, okay. but I will definitely, well, if you don't, if you don't want to, if no, you don't no, want to give I'll, it away, I'll, yeah. I'll answer the question. I'm, I'm happy yeah. to look, here's yeah. the thing. As I said earlier, Sean Cunningham, when, when he made the first Friday 13th, let's all remember mm. Jason Voorhees is an afterthought in the first movie. It's about, yeah. it's about Pamela Voorhees, a woman who's lost her child who is um, so heartbroken over this yeah. that she keeps murdering camp counselors in the idea that somehow they're not the, they're the ones who let her son drown. Yeah, That's what basically. About, right? Okay, so Sean made a, uh, you know, he made Agatha Christie's and then there were none with camp counselors. That's what he did. And by the way, he did it because John Carpenter made a movie called Halloween and made a ton of money. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because let's remember, you know, everybody gives Sean all these credits for, for being a horror guy. He's not. His first big hit was Last House on the Left. Movie he made before Last House on the Left is a movie called Together, which is a porn movie. Oh, wow. Um, he discovered Marilyn Chambers, who, by the way, went to my high school, Staples High School in Westport, Connecticut. <laughs> um, uh, and so, and in fact, Noel Cunningham played Marilyn Chambers' love child in that movie. He was a baby. She's that's her baby in that movie, in that huh. porn movie. Okay. So he makes he makes Last House and Left, and Wes Craven goes on to make horror films. Sean makes a movie called Here Come the Tigers, mm -hmm. uh, which was a ripoff of the Bad News Bears because the Bad News Bears came out and it made a lot of money. Yeah. And then he, and that didn't work. It was a disaster. It was a terrible movie. Then he makes a movie called Manny's Orphans, which is the Bad News Bears, but with soccer. So he makes two Bad News Bears movies, <laughs> both of them flop. Okay. He is running out of money, running out of time to figure out how to have a career in this business. Yeah. And he says, Victor Miller shows him the screenplay that ended up becoming Friday the 13th. And Sean said, well, Halloween was a hit. So we need a day of the year where this thing will become something that people watch all the time. Oh, now, yeah. By the way, being a very smart guy, he picks Friday the 13th because sometimes there's two of those in a year. Yeah. So the movie will get rented on more on both those occasions. Speaking of. 
damn Skippy. <laughs> um, so, by the way, it's the first set I was ever on as a kid. That was that was my first my first work as as a PA. I was ten oh, years nice. old. Oh, nice. Okay, ten years old. Right there. Um, Ari Lehman went to the same schools. Uh, we all grew up together. Um, so, so now Sean makes this movie about Pamela Voorhees. It's a yeah. giant hit. Paramount comes to him and says, "Hey, we want you to do part two. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Great, because I want to do exactly what John Carpenter wanted to do, which is John Carpenter wanted to tell tales of Halloween. He didn't want to tell Michael Myers movies. I remember that. Right. He had no interest in Michael Myers movies. He had interest in tales of Halloween, bad things that happened on Halloween. Because originally it had a different title, right? The first Halloween, like something the babysitter, the babysitter. The babysitter murders. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now Sean says, I want to tell tales of the unluckiest day of the year, Friday the 13th. The, the studio comes and says, well, what about that Jason kid? Mm -hmm. And he goes, the kid in the lake? The one that's dead? <laughs> they said, yeah, we want to make him the villain. Like her son is the one. He's like, that's it. But that's a ghost at the end. That's just, that's not. What? Yeah. Now, by the way, the ending of Friday the 13th, the only reason that scene with Jason is in it is because Brian De Palma made a movie called Carrie and it was a huge hit. And the last scare mm -hmm. was one of the big reasons it was such a hit. So Sean said, I'm going to go do that. So Sean never met a movie that made a ton of money that he wasn't willing to rip off entirely. Okay. <laughs> okay. So then he said, I'm not going to make Friday the 13th part two. I won't make it, but you're going to give me money and I'm going to end up being one of the producers on the movie. So you'll give me money. So I don't care. Okay. His wife edits that movie, uh, Susan Cunningham, who was like a mother to me and one of the greatest people I've ever known. Nice. And then um, the uh, uh, his, his protege, Steve Miner, ends up being the director on the film. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they come to Sean and they say, we got this guy and we're going to get put a sack on his head. <clears throat> and Sean was like, so the elephant man is the killer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So part three rolls around. Steve Miner's going to direct that as well. And Susan's 3D. Right. And they come to Sean and they say, hey, we got a better thing than the sack. He's like, well, what could be better than a potato sack? Wow, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they say, we're going to give him a hockey mask. And Sean's like, you're shooting the movie in the winter? They're like, no, it's dead summer. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, and I thought the potato sack was a stupid idea. Yeah. Okay, now, follow this. So now you have a filmmaker who had no interest in making Jason Voorhees movies. Yeah. Who thought the sack was stupid and thought the, the, the hockey mask was stupider. Okay? Yeah. And the only thing Sean Cunningham is allowed to make for the rest of his life is Friday the 13th movies. Hmm. Okay. And you have to remember, Jason Goes to Hell was the, only the second Friday the 13th movie that Sean ever had any hand in making. He oh, make okay. You make any of them. But the problem is Sean, Sean wanted to go legit. Sean wanted to make movies with Sean Penn. He had all kinds of these. He had all these movies he wanted to make, right? These great yeah. films. No one would make them with him. They would only make horror films, and eventually they would only make Friday the 13th movies with Sean. It's the only thing you get financed. Yeah. Here's what happens. Sean, who never made a movie with the guy in the hockey mask, is now synonymous with movies about a guy with a hockey mask. <laughs> yeah. So Sean hated the hockey mask. Hated it. And so the first order I get is, you can make a Friday the 13th movie, but you got to get rid of that fucking hockey mask. <laughs> Yeah. That's how that happened. That's weird. Okay. Um, hey, Sebastian, you got anything? Uh, oh, I've uh, been jumping in here. Oh, uh, that's okay. Um, I really, uh, I really like that. How, how you did the ending to pull, uh, to pull the mask to, to hell. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> kind of like Harry. So yeah. 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 Just, yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, no, no, no. You're right. Of, Lots of crazy, me uh, like memorable things about uh, your movie, uh, mm -hmm. especially when I watched it as a kid. Uh, when he eats the fucking heart, ah. that shit was oh, yeah, that shit was awesome. Yeah, 
in our first in our first test screening of the movie, the very first time we showed the film to an audience, yeah, there was a guy in the third row who, the minute that Richard Gant starts eating the heart, the guy yeah. threw up. Just oh. threw up in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> and all of the new line executives were, were in the back row high fiving each other. They were Blame. so excited. they were so thrilled. They're like, we're gonna make so much money. Uh, uh, well, well, I also kind of like the concept of uh, that, like that worm parasite. Yeah, that, that's supposed to be the the identity of the Jason Voorhees, the which essence. kind of gave, yeah. which kind of gave me like uh, the the thing vibes, like. Like oh, Parasite just keeps jumping. Yeah, yeah, keeps I can see in. that, dude. You're you're one of the you're one of the only people to go to the thing. Most people go like it's just like the hidden, which was a movie I hadn't seen when I made when I made <laughs> no. But I agree with out. Sebastian on that. Yeah, but it was like the thing is one of my favorite movies of all time, Me and too. I love the idea of like not knowing where the killer is. Yeah, it's just who, like oh who's shit, bad. he's the killer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, oh yeah. Oh, 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 the fucking dog's the killer. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's totally what that's totally what the inspiration yep. was was the thing. hundred percent. Like the movie yeah. was so different from all the other ones is why is why it's a cult classic. Thanks, man. Thank you. I appreciate that, yeah. Sebastian. That's I awesome. do I do know some people that um are writers and directors as well. They're actually from where I live, like the Central Valley, like near Fresno. Okay. Sure. You know, sure. and uh it's a brothers. They're brothers, uh, the Nelms brothers. Okay. They're they're the ones who did the movie called Fat Man with Mel Gibson as Santa Claus. Oh, technically, sure, I know Fat Man. Yeah, I've seen it. I, I actually own a copy of that. Movie. Yeah, I I've I've had a pleasure of chatting with them at one point, and uh, they're actually in the process of doing another project right now. Oh, good. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And if you ever want to work with them, I'm sure they would be ecstatic for that. Oh, that's, great. that's great. I like I like their film. Um, I it's funny that that you bring up Christmas horror because that the, la the last night. film I made, mm -hmm. um, which is actually going to be premiering in North America in um, in October Yay. On, on Screenbox. Um, I'm so freaking excited about this. Nice. Uh, is a movie called Secret Santa. And it's. Uh, it's to date my most award-winning movie. The movie has won awards all over the world. Um, oh, okay. It, it is a it, it's a Christmas horomedy. Um, <laughs> it is really funny. And I'm already really so brutal. Already, already so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. It's pretty. It, it, it's not a killer Santa, so it's not that. But it is. It is the most dysfunctional family ever uh, getting together for Christmas Eve dinner. And for some reason, nobody knows why, but for some reason, everybody starts saying exactly what they feel about each other. Uh -huh. And then everybody starts doing exactly what they want to do to each other. Ooh. Hmm. Yeah. And okay. it gets bloody. <laughs> and Bob, Bob, nice. Kurtz, Bob Kurtzman, the K of K and D effects, Bob Kurtzman, who did all the effects on Jason Goes to Hell with yeah. Howard Berger, he did all my effects in this movie. He's actually, Bob is, well, Bob's part of Skeleton Crew, my company. But mm -hmm. Bob is also going to be directing uh, a movie called Hunting Season for us next year in Kentucky. Nice. Awesome. You, you just brought up something that made me actually have a really good question because I recently just watched, and so did John. I don't know if Seabass actually got to see it yet. The Flash uh -huh. and, and uh, effects. The effects now today compared to visual effects then. Sure. You know, the whole practical versus heavy CGI, you know, mm -hmm. where do you stand on that? I look, here's the thing. I stand on do practical effects whenever you can do practical effects. Mm -hmm. um, take the time on set. It's I know that everybody says it's more expensive. It's a lie. Um, by the time you end end up doing everything you do to make the digital effects work, it costs just as much money and just mm -hmm. as much time. It's just as labor intensive. And here's the thing. The reason why the thing, the original, you know, John Carpenter's the thing, yeah. the remake of Howard Hawks' movie works. Why it works, there's not one digital effect in that movie. Not one. Nope. It's all practical. Okay. Yep. If you watch the requel, prequel, <laughs> um, from the early 2000, I think it was 2011, 2012. Yep. Oh, um, that one, yeah. yeah. Okay, that movie is nothing but CGI, and it looks dated now. Yeah, it does. But Carpenter's film still looks like he made it yesterday. It looks fresh. Yep. Yep. And yeah. that's that. Look, if you watch Star Wars Episode Four, if you watch yep. A New Hope, 
and then watch episode one, episode yeah. four. Jurassic it's, measure. It's like yeah. they shot it yesterday. Episode yeah. one, you go, wow, did someone do this on their Commodore 64? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? I still so, got one of those. <laughs> now, now, by yeah. the way, I will say this. For low-budget filmmaking, for ultra-low-budget filmmaking, I understand that sometimes you can't get blood to go in a certain direction. You can't spend all day trying to get little little oh, yeah. effects, nuances to happen. So I'm all for enhancing practical effects with a little digital. I think yeah. that's helpful, and I think it saves everybody a lot of headache. Oh, yeah. Like Jurassic Park is a perfect example of oh, that, it's actually. it's amazing. It's a perfect meld. It's yeah. A perfect yeah. meld. It oh, is. yeah. It is. It's great. Um, but by yeah. the way, again, because you have Stan Winston and because you have freaking dinosaurs on that set that are 12 tons. Oh, yeah. That are, yeah. That are real, that they built. Um, you, you ease the audience into this sense that everything is real. And that's a, that's a really big deal, man. It's like, you know, look, let's, and also let's be honest, it is ILM doing those effects. Oh yeah. yeah. And you know, you're, you're tugging the, you know, the creme de la creme plus someone like Stan Winston. Well, yeah, stuff's going to look great. So I am all for digital as long as it enhances what you already shot. Yeah. Yeah. That's that makes sense. Full amount. Yeah, I think they ushered in CG to think it, it would be a lot cheaper in the long run, and I think yeah. it's costing them a lot more. Yep. Yeah. Well, and it don't look as good. <laughs> no, not yeah. right now. Yeah. That's no, why I, I brought up the Flash. Because... Yeah, no, yeah. But I but I did see Avatar finally. I right. got it, and it looks amazing. Like yeah, when well, it's done when it's when it's done correctly and time's taken on it. Right. But I mean, how long did Cameron work on that movie? Well, no, most people don't. Like most people years. don't have. Twelve exactly. years to make a movie, you know. The film crazy. cost yeah. one billion dollars to produce. Yeah, that's what it cost. Yeah. I, yeah. I actually have. Um, it's very funny. The guy who did Steadicam on Jason Goes to Hell, mm -hmm. uh, who, who was my roommate in college, a guy named David Emmerichs, who's a brilliant uh, camera operator and um, and cinematographer in his own right. Uh, that guy worked has been working on Avatar for eight years. Damn. On the on all the sequels, he's literally been with Cameron for eight years working on it. Wow, that's awesome! I mean, and it's you know, I mean, that's a lifetime, man. In our yeah. business, eight years yeah. is a lifetime. It is. Yeah. I. It's yeah. funny because um, if you ever need uh, more actors, because it sounds like you you got a good hand in knowing a lot of people. I do. But recently, we've had um, Eric Edwards on, who played the big fat vampire in Blade. Oh, that's um, awesome. That's yeah, we've awesome. had him on. And we've had um, Diane Franklin, who was on Better Off Dead with John Cusack. I love Diane. I love oh, you Diane. know Diane? I know her. She's amazing. She's yeah, amazing. she was awesome to have on the show. She was very nice. Yeah. She did her French accent quite a bit. She's yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. She's amazing. And I've had Charlie Talbert before, too, if you know that name. I don't. No. The movie Angus from 1995. Oh, I love Angus. Yeah, yeah love he's, he's the guy Angus. Oh, that's awesome. Well, he's fantastic. Oh that's yeah, perfect. that's a great movie. I love I'm that. friends with them on Instagram, so I love it. That's awesome. I'll send them to your way. <laughs> Please do. Please do. He's terrific. Terrific. Awesome. Actor. No, uh, I actually um since I since I landed in Los Angeles, um I have been running a theater company that is part of Skeleton Crew. Okay. Um, and and my and Secret Santa is is cast completely out of my actors. Oh, okay. um, and a lot of them are people that you'll recognize because they work all the time. So I've been, yeah, I've been teaching acting and direction in LA for 20 some years now. So, yeah, that's cool. So, yeah. cause you had mentioned Adam Sandler earlier. Does that mean, um, because apparently he knew Jennifer Aniston just as long as he's been, you know, like with school and everything. Did you know her then too? Or I did no, not know Jen. I did not okay. know Jen. I met, I met Jennifer. I wrote a pilot uh, television series pilot for the people who made friends. Oh, okay. So I was there all the time. So oh, yeah. I had, to, I had to sit in on all their, you know, their tapings and everything. Um, so I got to know the whole cast and crew of that show. So okay. I met Jen then, but I didn't know her from school or, or back then. No. Yeah. Cause apparently they've known each other since they were young. And yeah. so <laughs> well, Jen, Jen and I are the same age as well. We're all the same kind of class. The, the, yeah. The same group, same peers. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I get that. 
the golden age. Yeah, I was um, <laughs> I was going to talk to you a little bit about like when I was watching the movie. Yeah. Um. Well, when I watched it as a kid, but watch it now. But the your connections, and then watching your uh, documentary, your connections with the Evil Dead, and how much that yes. Sam Raimi inspired you. But seeing the Necromem, I cannot never pronounce that because I don't have the word. Of, the yeah, I don't, I don't have the word in front of my face, so I can't. <laughs> oh, yes. But oh, when yes. I seen that, I was like, "That looks exactly like the prop from the movie," and you <laughs> explained to me about it because you were talking earlier about yeah. getting the glove, the yep. the getting Freddy's glove, and you said, "Well, Sam Raimi, whenever he brought me the Necromemicon, mm-hmm. that he just handed it to you in a Ziploc bag, and how <laughs> the difference in filmmaking it was." It really yeah. is. It really is yeah. a difference. Um. Uh, look, I, I wanted the Necronomicon the movie in the same way that I wanted um, the the dagger to be from Evil Dead as well that ends up killing Jason at the end of the movie. Um, spoiler alert. Um, uh, because I I felt as though as a kid when I watched the when I watched Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, okay, which happens two weeks, literally two weeks after the events of the first movie, okay. Jason Voorhees, who we saw in the first film, in the lake, is still an 11-year-old boy who drowned in the lake. Yes. Okay? He's a little boy. Yeah. He jumps up, attacks Adrian King, pulls her down in the water. He's still a yeah. little boy because he's played by Ari Lehman, who I went to school with. So it's a little boy. Yeah. Somehow, two weeks later, this little boy has gained 140 pounds of, of body weight, yeah. has grown at least three feet, um, has has gotten a full set of clothes that fit him perfectly, has learned how, to, learned how to read, because the only way you could find someone's address was to go in the white pages back then. There was no internet. There was a, so you had, to, you had to know how to read. Um, has learned how to drive. Because I don't believe that he walked through town holding his mom's head. <laughs> um, hey. Then, not only that, he's got a hell of a sense of humor. Like, he's a really funny dude, Jason. Very funny. Yes. Because not only does he sneak into Alice's apartment, he then hides his mother's head in the fridge <laughs> and then hides and waits and waits yes. <laughs> this is gonna be hilarious yes. <laughs> and it's only when alice opens up the refrigerator that he then jumps out and goes you saw her eh. yes <laughs> then he has to take her body back and mom's head back back to his shack Without being in, seen. in the woods <laughs> to put it up in his shrine again Needs a car for that. I don't see him just carrying Alice's body through town and the <laughs> head in the bag. Okay. So again, bring out your dad. <laughs> I'm I'm uh 12 when that movie comes out, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is some bullshit. <laughs> and I'm 12 saying crazy that. Crazy right? potholes. It's right, exactly. Then you know. By part four, he's hamburger meat. Part five, he's not even Jason. Part six, he's resurrected as a zombie corpse. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. So my my feeling was when I got to part nine, I was like, okay, none of this makes sense unless <laughs> unless Pamela Voorhees, who would do anything to have her son back, anything, sells her soul would have absolutely found the Book of the Dead. Oh, would yeah. Have absolutely yeah. read from the Book of the Dead to resurrect her child. Yeah. Now imagine yeah. she does that, but her son is this child at the bottom of Crystal Lake who is now under 30 years of sediment. Yeah. Who's, who's only knows darkness and cold, right? Mm-hmm. And doesn't know where to go, doesn't know where his mother is. And then he peers through the dark water of Crystal Lake and sees his mother lakeside get her head cut off, which makes him rise to the surface, attack Alice. But again, he's only this little boy at this point. But the rage in seeing his mother murdered. Yeah. Well, if he's part of the evil dead, if he's a deadite or a revenant, and I love when people are like, deadites are only black. I'm like, shut up. Shut yeah. Up. 
<laughs> I, I love all the I love all the Necronomicon historians that show up in the haters group. It's like, <laughs> hey kids, we all make filmmakers make this shit up. So mm -hmm. so your opinion of what the rules are, we don't care. We're canon, you're not. So now it's like, great, there's an evil spell that allows this kid with that perfect. rage to become anything. So now I believe in two weeks he's a full grown man and he yeah. knows how to read and he knows how to think and he knows how to great. I'm now I'm with you. You're so the plot holes. <laughs> right. So Jason Jason goes to hell, I like to think of as the rogue one of the Friday thirteenth franchise. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> that's that's a pretty fair fair comparison. But yeah, because I we, we cover the hole. We, we, we get you to realize why there is a three meter hole in the Death Star that if you shoot yep. down that thing, you blow up the whole skull. I, I remember Family Guy making fun of that, actually. It's like, how's the you know ship coming? And it's like, oh, there's like this one area, you know, but it's like the <laughs> not nine. But no one will like, shoot at that. <laughs> it's funny yeah. as hell, though. <laughs> right. right. But, that's, but that was my whole thing. It's like, how do I justify all this bullshit in the timeline mm -hmm. and I created something. Now here's the problem. New line didn't own the evil dead. So I couldn't say the evil dead. I couldn't say all this stuff from saying, ne yeah, all the Necronomicon or whatever. Yeah. But, but the K and B guys were doing, were, um, were, were doing hearts. Uh, I'm sorry. We're doing army of darkness. Mm -hmm. Right. So they were shooting that and they asked me, do you want to come up and meet Sam? And I was like, fuck yeah, I want to meet Sam Raimi. What are you <laughs> kidding me? So okay. I I run out to, to 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 the middle of nowhere to meet Sam Raimi. I end up um puppeteering one of the deadites, um, which was amazing and like incredible fun. And uh I said to Bob Kurtzman, I said, Hey, I got this idea. Um, I'm putting a lot of Easter eggs in the movie. Do you think Sam would let me have the Necronomicon? Mm -hmm. Kind of using it to justify Jason's evil. Yeah. And he told Sam, and Sam handed me the Necronomicon in a plastic bag, in a Ziploc bag. I think Sam was just like, I love that. He sure. did love it. He did yeah. love it. Now, the problem is the guy who made the Necronomicon, the guy who actually designed that Necronomicon, yeah. was pissed. Oh, was oh. Pissed. I don't know because why he, he would be so upset, though. Because he didn't get paid. He wanted to get paid. Oh. That's all. He just wanted to get paid. So Sam, um, you know, Sam regretted doing that because he hurt his friend and there was all kinds of upset about it. But again, I didn't know that. And all I asked for was the props so I could use it in the movie. Um, and so it's in the film. It's canon. I know there are people who are like, they don't like that he's part of the evil dead. Well, grow up. You know, there's a lot of things you don't like. Um, I wanted to make a movie. Look, honestly, here's the thing. I wanted to make a movie that actually um, respected the fans. My feeling about the logic holes in these movies was that it's a bunch of executives, and this is exactly what happens. They sit around and they go, oh, that, that audience, they're all idiots. They don't care. Just put boobs and blood in it and they're happy. And I'm like, yeah. no. But no substance. Right. We deserve yeah. a story. We deserve yeah. character. Look, here, and, and by the way, to that end, my biggest problem with all of these franchise horror movies, all of them, is that the first one is the reason they become a franchise, right? That first movie is badass. Every time. Yeah. Halloween, Friday 13th, um, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. These movies are incredible films, right? Yeah. Because they scare the bejesus out of us. Those All yeah. three of the movies I just mentioned are fucking scary. Yeah. And then they go to make the sequels. Now, by the way, Friday 13th Part 2 is one of the rare sequels that is still really scary. The reason why... Is because we didn't know Jason Voorhees. We we knew we that this was a new killer. This was some new guy, right? So much mystery, right? Yeah. By the third movie in all these franchises, we start rooting for the villain. Yeah, that's the problem, guys. They're not scary anymore. They, They're not hard. Yeah, yeah. They you want them to kill the people, right? Or amusement well, park rides. They, they come camp. It. And they yeah. keep making the the heroes, the, the, the characters that are going to die, they keep making them less and less sympathetic because they don't want you to be upset when they die. Yeah. So they intentionally make these characters thin. They don't give them a ton of life. 
And with with Jason goes to hell, I was like, I want to go back to Jaws rules. Because look, here's the thing: <laughs> nobody ever cheers for the shark. No one. No, I cheer, I cheer for the shark. There you go. Um, <laughs> you're the one guy. Um, I have an entire bathroom that's dedicated to Jaws. Well, dude, it's it's one of my all time favorite <laughs> movies, and it's and for me, it's the single best directed film of all time. So, but here's the thing: you want Chief Brody to get home to his kids. Yeah, of course. You want him to survive, and that's the thing. I wanted to make a movie that had characters that you give a shit about, so that if they die, you're upset. Yeah. So that and and also, okay, I gotta hide the killer. So now the killer can come from any direction. It's not going to come from the place you think it's going to come from. So it was this sense of, I want to make something that's scary for the audience and not just another like, oh, great. How are they going to die? It's going, oh. it's going through the, it's going through the yes. medicines. Yes, absolutely. Which exactly you did. It kept everybody on their toes. It was a, a, bre a breath, of, breath of fresh but, air. But you, you do. The series, like it's, yeah. it's so different. Like I, I don't even know how to explain it. Uh, I have a one question. From the beginning of the movie, yeah, I think it's the Easter egg, but I'm not sure. Sure, I think on one of the sheriff's jackets it says Cunningham on the. Yeah, it's Cunningham County. Room. It's Cunningham County. Yeah. I, I put I put that okay. in there just to, as a nod to Sean. Good. I, I, you, I want to make sure that that was what the thought was. It absolutely was. You also said you tried to throw in in the first seven minutes of the movie, like every every trope from the yes rest of the Friday the Thirteenth movies made at that point. Every bad decision that a character can make, <laughs> all in seven yes. minutes. Yes. yes, yeah. And I got Julie yeah. Michaels to do it, who is so beautiful and funny and amazing that it was like, okay, yeah. audience is perfect. totally going to be with this young woman who's adorable, <laughs> and so we'll play all of you know when she drops her makeup bag. It's one of my favorite things in the whole film. And no. she, yeah. she comes back up and there's nobody in the mirror. It's, it's just, it's this constant sort of like playing with the audience. Yeah. Well, it, it, you, you keep going. I, did, I know it's throughout the movie. You have the shower scene and the oh, yeah. lights go off. The lights get oh, yeah. turned off in the shower oh, yeah. scene. You yep. do it a couple of times in the movie. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, you know, the light bulb burns out. So she goes to a yeah. shed to get a light bulb. <laughs> I mean, it just every dumb choice for a, for a horror movie <laughs> character to do. But... <laughs> The whole idea behind it was this is a woman who's trying to lure Jason out. And so when you realize that she's actually a plant and that she is doing, uh, uh, by purpose. the way, I was offered to direct screen right after this movie. Oh, wow. Yes. And again, Uncle well, then Wes, there's a fun fact we can share with the audience now. Uncle, <laughs> we Uncle, Uncle, Wes, Uncle Wes showed up and said, hey, I want to direct that movie. And I went, well, I guess I'm not going to be directing that movie now. Oh, fuck. Um, but it's all good. It's all good. But by the way, they did. They offered me that movie because they watched Jason Goes Tell and went, wow, this guy is already doing all this. I was doing all yeah. this, all the self-referential stuff. I was doing all the meta stuff without winking at the audience. Yeah. yeah that's the difference. It's part of the plot. So it wasn't like, here are the rules of a horror movie. No, it was, here's a woman luring a guy who comes whenever you do these dumb things. Yeah. 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 You explained it in the documentary as you wanted to do a lot more world building in this. Yes. And kind of clear up the the clear problems the with the older <laughs> movies, kind of congeal the story a little bit better. Yeah. I think you did a good job with it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I, yes. totally I agree with that. Totally Thank agree. You. Same story. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you personally have like a number one favorite movie? Uh, yeah, but it's, <laughs> but it's not. It's it, look, <laughs> my top five is almost all horror movies, which is hilarious. My <laughs> favorite film, my favorite film of all time is uh, is uh, All That Jazz by Bob Fosse. Okay. Um, okay, and it has been my favorite movie since I was eleven years old. So it's. Um, <laughs> It's always been my favorite, but but I'm gonna again, have to check that out then. I, oh, it's an it's an amazing film. It's an amazing movie. By the way, the only movie up till that date that showed an actual um, open heart surgery live in the film. Oh, really? Yeah. 
That's pretty yeah. awesome. Oh yeah, wow, it's pretty, it's pretty badass. Yeah. It's a great to watch yeah. that movie. Oh, so good, <laughs> yeah. so good. Because sometimes um, I know, and it's Roy Scheider. It's it's Roy yeah. Scheider's finest performance. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, because I know people sometimes struggle to think about what their ultimate favorite movie is and stuff like that. Like me, I can honestly say that I do have a number one, Which and is? these guys know what it is. It's what is uh, it? the Crow. Oh sure. I, to I totally get that, man. It's a terrific film. No, oh, I love that movie. And I know that they already basically made the reboot with Spil with Bill Skarsgård as the new Eric Draven and stuff like that. Yeah. But, you know, when looking back at your work with Jason Goes to Hell, mm -hmm. it's almost like you <laughs> could have done like maybe one of the sequels or even maybe the reboot in itself. Sure, sure. I actually, um, Ed Pressman, who made the first film, who's the producer of the first movie, um, Ed Pressman and I worked together for a couple of years before before he died, um, and uh, and he had actually talked to me about doing a Crow movie with him. Oh, so, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is many years ago, but yes. Rob Zombie was approached too, actually. I, and and I don't think that would have been a bad idea. Actually, I think yes. Rob might have done a really interesting job with it. Would he would have done a good job. You know, I mean, his rock and roll cred i think would have made it made for an interesting well his movie. visualness in general Absolutely. yeah Absolutely. Well, oh my God. I, do have to say, I do have to say alex prius is uh i mean what he what he delivered in that first movie it is so beautiful yes it and, is and if you haven't seen dark city which is the movie he followed it up with yes. i love dark city wow is that a great film great that movie. is yes that, that movie is so good that um roger ebert did the commentary track on that movie Oh, somebody just said that Jason Goes to Hell is their second favorite movie. It's mid level. Mid level media. Oh, it's Ken. Yeah. It's Ken. That's awesome. Yep. Thanks, yep. man. Thank you. I appreciate that. Listen, by the way, Jason Goes to Hell isn't even my favorite Friday Friday movie. So, you know. Really? What's I'm, your favorite yeah. Friday? Uh part six. No. Oh, okay. That's six new beginning, there. isn't it? Friday. Uh, Direct and stable freak says no, that's Adam Marcus for Cream. That's Jason Lives. That's Jason Lives. That's yeah. oh Jason Lives. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. it's Tommy Tommy McLaughlin's movie. Tommy and I have been friends for years, and I, I adore Tommy. Tommy is really an amazing guy. Did you get to meet Corey Feldman? Because I know he was a part of it. So I have. I haven't. In fact, my wife worked with Corey a couple of years ago on Thirteen Fanboy. My my wife Deborah is in Thirteen Fanboy. And um, and uh, her and Corey worked together on that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Somebody just said you uh, should uh, direct Scream Seven. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> direct and stable. Yeah, because if you were approached before, why not now? Absolutely, absolutely. Yep. Um, <laughs> no, it's uh, look. I mean, the, the the great thing about having done Jason Goes to Hell, um, you know, is it afforded me a career that I mean, I've been working for thirty years in our industry. Um, that's crazy. Like, that's a crazy, uh, like, I am blessed to, to, to have had the career I've had. And, you know, I mean, my wife and I did Texas Chainsaw together in 2013. Um, and, you know, now I'm doing, I'm doing like this slate of movies through my production company where we're, I'm making things that I've always wanted to make my whole life. So, well, if you need extras, we're here. Well, thank thank you guys. I please. We always need excellent. That's that's something you always need. Um, no, we're we're, just we're just really. Um, you know, and I'm I'm also um, the 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 philosophy of our company is that you know I'm giving a lot of people a chance to do to make movies mm -hmm. that have been in my business for forever and not given the chance. You know, guys who've written great movies but never got a chance to direct. Yeah. Um, you know, Bob Kurtzman, who who has directed a lot of movies. But again, as directors get older, the you know they they the studios don't come to you; they go to younger people, which I understand. Yeah, they do. But you know what? Bob's a great director and a visionary filmmaker, and I was like, "Yeah, I want to make I want to make the next movie with you." Like done. Oh yeah. So you know, I'm working with an incredible writer, a guy named John Esposito, um, who won the Writers Guild Award for The Walking Dead for a couple of years. Oh, um, there you go. He, he wrote Stephen King's Graveyard Shift back in the day, and the guy. Oh, nice! The guy has got such a good eye. He's so talented, and I'm like, how have you not directed yet? Like, like how is that pocket. possible? Yeah, now now that's awesome. You know, we also get to hit subject matter. We're we're doing a film uh, right now with a couple of lovely uh, producing partners um, who brought us this movie called Fat Camp Massacre. 
and it's um, it's <laughs> awesome it's because it's it's a big. <laughs> It does for people of size what Get Out did for people of color. Yeah, gotcha. you know, and it's like it's attacking this, this, this. Um, you know, people can still be like outwardly cruel about people who are overweight, mm -hmm. and it's this big fuck you to body dysmorphia and to to people who behave that way. Um, and it's really funny and it's really brutal. It's it's probably the bloodiest movie we're making right now. It is it is just gallons of of the red. Um, Nice. But yeah, but we get to tackle subject matter that I'm like, yeah, I want to tell that story. Like, let's do that. Mm -hmm. so, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's uh it's a really cool movie. So we're yeah, we're we're just doing a whole bunch of stuff right now. So the documentary is gonna be coming out later this year, Hearts of Darkness, the making of the final Friday. And Secret Santa uh, is going to finally have its North American distribution premiere this October. So, Ooh, yeah, nice. Yeah. But is it going to get a physical release? We we already have a physical release. The oh, only, you do? Yes. Yeah, the only way you can it. get it, the only way you can get it, is through us. Is through Skeleton Crew. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, SecretSantaTheMovie.com. Okay, you hear and that, people? Got, Go to the website. <laughs> it's buy it's a copy. By the way, it's limited edition, um, limited edition uh, DVDs and Blu-rays, and we've also got like all kinds of cool swag. Um, nice. It's so signed by cast and crew, and it's it's pretty cool. But what's really cool is that there's a documentary about the making of Secret Santa uh, called Naughty or Nice. Oh, okay. And, um, and it's also about the making of Skeleton Crew, about the forming of the company. And nice. what's wild is that the people, the people at Screenbox and Bloody Disgusting and Cynodyne, they didn't just buy Secret Santa; they bought that doc as well. Yeah, so that doc yeah. is going to be streaming as well. So yeah, so Skeleton Crew is going to have three new things out in the American marketplace later this year. I actually, um, long while ago, I was like, if I were to make a movie, what would I make a movie about? And one day, it just kind of came to me. I'm not the greatest when it comes to writing down, like, say, a story story, but mm -hmm. um, ideas, sometimes they just randomly pop sure. in my head. Sure. And I wanted to call, the, like, the title, The Winds of October. Mm -hmm. And then the concept would be, like, taking the idea of the uh, not movie, the show Supernatural with the... Oh, sure. the brothers but also mixing that reality show paranormal investigators mm -hmm. you know kind of mixing it together and then giving it one hell of a ride in a way to where it kind of resembles found footage but not completely sure sure so that's something i've thought of sounds great you should try to you should try to develop that i could try but i'm not the greatest when it comes to writing down so <laughs> i get it i get it no. Yeah, it's, uh, again, you know, I've spent my whole life trying to get good at this job. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a thing that you have to practice every day and, and work towards it every day. But it is attainable. You know? yeah. and, and especially now, you know, when, when everybody has literally, you know, a movie yeah, studio in their pocket. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. You know, you can write it, shoot it, edit it, and distribute it from yep. this. It's kind of amazing. It's pretty crazy. Oh, yeah. Really that is crazy. Yeah, because John right here is actually um, technically our producer of this, you know, sure. stream. Sure. So he's in charge of the the stream in itself when it comes uh -huh. to the effects, the countdown, totally. the visuals, all of it. Yeah, I'm not that great at it. I'm not a I'm not a hands on <laughs> artist. If I was a if I was a if I could draw and do hands on artwork, I could sure. really work photoshop and after effects and stuff like that i do my best but i, I find the technology interesting but if yeah. the complexities of that software if you're like really good at it the, the sky's the limit with it yep you know it's true it is yeah true. he's more of the behind the scenes guy anyway so he prefers like he he was actually really excited for this one because it's the first time we're having somebody that's more behind the scenes than they are in say in front of the camera sure and well, it's right. more his field Directors are somebody I follow when it comes to movies more than yep. anybody. Right, like that's right, how right. I've always sure. been. I kind of follow the directors of movies more than actors and things like that. I, I tend to know a director of the movie more than a actor that was in it. Right, right. And um, and uh, they, I, it's just more interesting to follow the career of a director. You know, kind of following their trajectory through the movies and sure. you know. Sure. I agree with just, that. It's just my it's just my personal my personal choice or personal um, interest. What you're into, awesome. yeah. yeah. Awesome. 
Oh, yeah. Do you have, like, your own personal favorite directors? Me? Yeah, I guess. I absolutely do. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, Bob Fosse before he was, uh, and he was my favorite theater director as well. Oh, okay. Um, but, uh, but no, look, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge, you know, Spielberg fan, like a stupid Spielberg fan. Um, William Friedkin, I think is uh, a, a very underrated genius. Um, Roman Polanski is one of my favorites. Um, I, um, God, there's so many. Well, now uh, I know why Robin Williams yeah, said to... Fosse, Fosse, Fosse in the bird decay. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no matter how you feel about Polanski, <laughs> um, Chinatown's probably one of the best movies ever made. I totally agree. I totally can agree with that. Great. Chinatown's and, a really great movie. Rosemary's yeah. Baby is insane. It, oh, yeah. that's so, a classic. Yeah. Incredibly well done. Um, you know, no, he... he uh, uh, again, I, I, I always try to separate the artist from the art because... Mm -hmm you start bringing personalities and stuff that people have done in their lives. Um, I, I try not to judge, honestly. Um, of I, course. I, I, I have my own personal feelings about a lot of this stuff, but, um, but I, I, I look at the, at the work and, you know, look, even on, let's say the flash, right. Mm -hmm. out, right. Yeah. So Ezra Miller um, seems like a pretty unwell dude. Yeah. Not doing so good, you know? Um, and that I hope that he gets help. I also, of hope, yeah. I also hope that if he, if, yeah. if he is convicted of any of the crimes that people have said he did, yeah. um, you know, uh, I hope he spends some time in, in, in a, in a jail cell for it. Cause you know, fuck that. That's sad. Yeah. Yeah. He pays that's, his dues for what he did. Right. Exactly. That, yeah. that said, um, you know, I went to see the flash, uh, second day it was out and I went because I was like, okay, I'm not going to overlook the the work of the director yeah uh, the other actors like michael keaton who's oh, extraordinary in the movie he's so no, yeah. yeah and the other 1500 artists that spent years of their lives making that movie because one guy is a dick oh, yeah. Yeah. i'm not doing that like i'm not that guy you know so yeah i'm, I'm gonna look at the work um there, yeah. there are look there are times if there's a director or writer that I really have a problem with. And I, I think they're, I think that they've done something really repugnant. I'll have a tougher time spending money on their movies. That That's definitely true. It's funny you say that. Cause when we had Diane Franklin on, um, they, they mentioned, or she mentioned, um, what's that guy's name? Uh, John, that you were, cause I didn't know who that was. That was the nerd kid. Yeah. Dan Snyder. Yeah. Dan oh, yeah. Snyder. Yeah. yeah. Cause everybody there's, you know, horrible stories going on around him too awful yeah awful awful Definitely. look and, and by the way listen i think it's great that that there's a disinfecting light that's shining on all of these dill holes Problems. like i i'm you know i, I it was funny because i was just talking about this with my editor on the documentary mm -hmm. and you know um, there's a, a story, kind of a, a, little, a little bit of a famous story about Jason Goes to Hell when uh, Julie Michaels was running through the woods at the beginning of the movie, when Agent Marcus is running through the woods. Um, and she she um, she had to do it a couple times, right? There were a couple times she needed to, to, to do the run. Mm -hmm. And I suddenly noticed that her, I noticed blood coming from her, from her footsteps. And I was like, Julie, she cut no. What's going on? And she's like, nothing. I'm good, boss. I'm good. I was like, okay, but honey, what's yeah. up? Like, what are you doing? And again, I was 23 when this, when we were shooting this. It was 23. Oh, okay. And so she said, I'm ready to go. And I said, Julie, why aren't you wearing the booties? We gave you booties. She goes, no, no, no. It looks better on camera without the booty. I said, I don't care how it looks. You're not getting hurt. I said, show me your feet. So she showed me and her feet were cut up. Oh. And I and I swept her up off of her feet. I picked mm -hmm. her up immediately. There she is in her towel and her Velcro. Towel. Yeah, I picked her up and I walked her to medical and I <laughs> and we took care of her feet. Okay, now the immediate reaction from people is, "Oh, are you guys dating?" Oh. And I'm like, "No." And, I was helping her. <laughs> and by the way, yeah. nor would I ever date someone that I was directing in a movie. Are you kidding me? Well, like, James Cameron did it to not. Linda Hamilton. Well, here's the thing. If you're already married or, or, uh, one sec, guys, I'm sorry. Um, if you're 
dealing with something that, you know, you're in a pre-existing marriage. Look, my, my wife and I now work together on every movie, right? That's different. Yeah. But I'm a 23 year old bachelor. I'm not trying to like get it with my, with my cast. That's just nuts. Yeah. And I don't understand all of these, these people that do like, I don't get it. I understand that romances happen on set. That happens. Okay. But it just never even crossed my mind to do that. Yeah. It's just not okay. No, it's no not, I get it's that. Not professional. So. And, I, and I will tell you, I have no friends that would behave that way either. Because it's like, it, it seems to be running rampant. Um, yeah. I have, look, I have worked for some people that you're like, wow, wow, wow. I hate um, to ask the question, did you work for the Weinstein brothers at all? Yes, I, yeah, 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 and they tried. They tried to hire us a couple times, Dev and I. Um, uh, look, for, I mean, Bob was usually the person we dealt with. I only met Harvey once. Okay. Um, Bob Weinstein was just, you know, gruff. Okay, um, which is fine. But no, Dev and I worked for Kevin Spacey for a couple of years. Oh, okay. Um, and you know, that sucks. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's awful. You know. Um, cause it doesn't matter who's getting abused. If someone's getting abused, someone's getting abused. It's yeah. Not okay. yeah. It's not okay. It's um, nice. but I do love, I love that all that stuff is coming out and these guys are paying the price, which is good. They need mm -hmm. to. Um, it's like when Corey Feldman mentioned, um, Charlie Sheen is one of the people that I guess took advantage of Corey Haim or something right. that kind of shocked me a little bit because don't get me wrong. I mean, if it happened, then yes, he should be punished, mm -hmm. but if it didn't actually happen and it, you know, it was just the name that floated around or something like that. I mean, because I like Charlie Sheen. I do. Well, look, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, 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 I tend to come from the point of view of going, look, I think every victim needs to be heard. For sure. But, but this idea of everybody should be believed. No, no, no. No. no, no. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. That's not the way, that's not the way our, our, yeah. our judicial system works. Exactly. So if someone has a claim that somebody did something, it needs to be investigated immediately. If nothing is found, then then that's the end of that. Yeah. And my problem is, is that there's a lot of people. Look, there are people who will weaponize um, a claim to hurt somebody. And that and by the way, I, it's not about the person they hurt. It's about all the other people who have serious claims, who have been assaulted, who have yeah. been hurt, who are hurt by those kind of claims. I will tell you. I have a good friend. I won't say who it is, but it's a it's a major person in our industry. Okay. Um, who is such a defender of Michael Jackson? It shocked me. Like nope. I was, I never expected it. It's not the kind of person you would ever think would be defending Michael Jackson, but <laughs> defended Michael Jackson to me in such a way. I was like, wow! Like good for you. You're really standing by this. Oh like, yeah. Well done. Okay. And again. The man never went to trial. He was never convicted of a crime. No, nope. that's an issue. Like, we do have a court. It is the way it's supposed to work. And so, I look. I think. I think every victim should be heard, and every victim's allegation should be um, analyzed. Should be well. Should be. Should be. You know, people should investigate. Like that should oh, go yeah. to an well, investigative it's... force to deal with it. The bottom, the bottom line, it's innocent to proven guilty. And the, in the public's right. in the last, right. you know, 10 years or so, the public's went so they, they're the opposite. They're yeah. guilty until proven innocent. Everybody's guilty. And then suddenly, yeah. oh, they didn't do it. That's yeah, a, that's a problem. Yeah. And, and again, I think we I, look, I'm I'm I, I, I'm not I'm yeah. not up for mob mentality. <laughs> I don't think it works. Oh, yeah. Well, and Johnny yeah. Depp, he went through that with Amber Heard, you know, and. All the women that he's ever dated, ever known, has never said or even thought of him as an abuser, ever. Right. Yeah. And they'll be the first to say that. But then Amber heard just because she's on a power trip or whatever. Like, I heard that the new Aquaman, they cut her scenes either yeah, completely gone. or down to like yeah, five minutes, gone. something like yeah, that. Yeah, she's gone. She's gone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. she is gone. She's okay. Just, yeah. She's just crazy. That's the problem. With Look, but again, again, look here again. The, the, the problem oh, is, is that na we are, we are now so inundated in this idea of people's personal lives rather than the work that they're doing. And again, uh, my real problem, my only problem with all of this is that we're, we're, we're going to lose some great films, some great art and not just the work of the person who was the abuser, 
we're going to lose the work of all the other people who who created that art. Yeah. And that, you know, look, let's be honest. Stanley Kubrick was not a very nice man. Alfred Hitchcock was a son of a bitch. These are not nice people. These were not yeah. nice guys. Yep. But you know what? Yeah. Um, I want to be able to look at their movies. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I'm I'm uh, personally I'm I'm Jewish. And, you know, you look at someone like Lainey Reifenstahl, who directed uh, Triumph of the Will, right? Which was really one of the movies that helped install Hitler to power in Germany. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so she is a co-conspirator in the Nazi party. She is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's a disgusting piece of crap. She is a disgusting person. But you want to know something? She's a hell of a filmmaker. Yeah. And I've seen all of her work. Yeah. And you know what? I want to have access to that work. I want to be able to see that work. Study. Because, again, as a student of storytelling, I want to know what, how she said what she said. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just want the opportunity to see it. I don't want it to be canceled out of existence. I don't it's think anything should ever be canceled out of existence. I think it's... Yeah. Well, yeah. It's yeah. Control. Cancel culture has got out of control. It has. And it's yeah. funny because... Yeah. Um, cancel culture has been around forever because if you think about it with like rock bands like Kiss, people tried to sure. cancel them when they sure. came out, sure. you know, so it's been around forever. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. There's always, everybody's going to have outrage about something. Oh, but, yeah. You know, I, I agree with Stephen King when he says, you know, the minute you hear that a book is getting banned in your local library, mm -hmm. immediately, immediately go to a bookstore and buy a copy of that book. Read mm -hmm. that book. Because, what was it like? The catcher yeah. in the rye was one of them. Oh, there, there's so many, but so it's, many, it's, but yeah, that's one some, I remember. It's somebody telling you you shouldn't read that. No, 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 no. If you I tell me I read shouldn't it. read it, then I then I yeah. gotta read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but but what if what if those books being banned are pornographic and shouldn't be shown to children? Yeah, you know what though, I, I gotta tell you, man, I grew up with. Yeah. Uh, Have you seen any of the books that they're that's yeah. that's current that's being talked about? Yes, I'm just oh, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I have. I, I'm I have. not for banning any books either. Right. But, right. I, but there's I, a difference between exposing children to pornographic material yeah. than without a doubt. But let's be honest. I mean, we we um, we live in a time when um, I love when people want to say want to protect kids from pornography, yet they have a Netflix account that's just sitting on the television. We that and, too. And they've got HBO and they've got, you know, full on nudity, full on simulated sex in half the shows that are on HBO or better yet, there's a computer or a phone in every kid's hand. Yeah. And I'm sorry, like this is literally a porn machine. If you yeah. Let a child, if you let a child have it. So oh, definitely it's it's it. The, the, the problem is, is that. Again. A child reading a book, first off, getting kids to read, oh my God, whatever we got to do. Look, I'm someone who's like, hey, give them comic books because they'll read. Yeah. Like a comic book is a gateway to reading. For well, I got a, I got lucky with my kid. He's 15 and he, at first he didn't like the concept of reading, I but he, he loves it now. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're 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 letting that child expand their brain and their and their and their possibilities of what the world looks like. Well, so, yeah, no, imagination. Am I, you know, am I interested in a kid reading softcore porn? No, of course not. But no. by the way, but by the way, that's that's not. For, again, I am I am totally for parents, and this includes films. Like mm -hmm. when, I, when I've known kids that were like eight, seeing Jason Goes to Hell, I'm like, wait a minute, man, I didn't make that for an eight year old. No, too, it's too adult. What are you doing? I was about to say I was five years old when I watched uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. There you go. And that's and by the way, you are you are you OK? I'm fine. It turned out all right. Yeah. Yes, I did. All right. This is well, my it's point. not just uh, it's just not yeah. the nudity. I mean, it's, yeah, we'll see. And these, that's what my mom. Are, yeah. Well, these books are like teaching children how to. No, I get that. Perform sexual acts on each other. It's. It kind of no, goes beyond. I get what you're saying. We we can ag agree to disagree yeah. on this yeah. subject matter, yeah. but the I thing just, is, I, is it. But what we're doing is discussing it, and that's what a lot of people won't exactly. do. Exactly what they won't do. Yeah. Right. I exactly. Agree. I agree with you. And yeah. look, for me, man, I yeah. am for every parent has yeah. has the absolute right to take any book, any movie, yeah. anything out of a child's hand and go, no, this is not for yeah. you. 
Yeah, um, exactly. I, I, I just don't think it has a place in public education, state run public education. If you know, if you, you shouldn't have that stuff in there if they're gonna, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. Think, it's just I, nice. I, but I think the bar on that is 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 very low for certain people. Well, it's funny and, because and my mom concern. my mom actually let me watch the Silence of the Lambs as a kid, but sure. would not let me watch the Buffalo Bill tucking his dick in between his legs scene. Yeah. Cover your eyes. I work, yeah, by the way, she literally this, did. Go into your room, let this scene pass, and then you can come back out. By the way, that's one of the first but, movies uh, I worked on. I mean, really? I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a conservative, you know. I'm kind of a middle yeah. of the road person, but sure, sure, sure. I love the nudity in your movie. That's one of the things I pointed out Thank here. You. Like I, I did a. Thank you. And we need more tits in movies. I now. could not agree more. I think <laughs> yeah. we need more. I think we need more nudity in all of it. I, I couldn't agree with you more, man. Speaking I'm all. Speaking of, it. did you see? I don't know if you've seen it yet, but no hard feelings. Have you heard heard about any of it? No, but I heard Jennifer I heard Lawrence. It. Yeah, I heard yeah. it's great, and I'm I'm yeah. a big fan of hers anyway. I'm a huge fan of hers. Yeah, Jennifer Lawrence. The yeah. only the, there there's a nude scene with her in it. Like she comes out of the ocean. Yeah, she huh. and she's full frontal nude, full frontal. Like I wow. mean, full and all the way around. I mean, wow. I mean, you don't get any like definition really down below, but sure, sure, sure. But you, but I mean, but they you know. full full but frontal you know, shot. Yeah, it's amazing yeah. about that too. She's yeah. the producer of that movie. She's the one who got that movie made. Oh, it's nice. Great. She produced well, it. And like Margot you know, Robbie, Wolf Street, you know. Absolutely. But look, here's the thing. There, there is a reason Babylon. why there's a re look, movies are the dream factory, right? They're supposed to give us all the things that we aspire to, that we want in our life, that we that we find beautiful or erotic or whatever it is, right? I'll be back. Um, there's there's no reason to not allow a film that's R-rated to that go to a place where 17 and older can see all of that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And look, let's be honest, all of us. I mean, come on. When we were teenagers, yeah. we got we got our hands on nudie magazines or we <laughs> saw we saw a porn movie. We did all that yeah. stuff. We did. Yeah. And the yeah. whole point is is that is that yes, uh, I'm not advocating for kids seeing anything they shouldn't see, but I saw Clockwork Orange before I was yeah. 10 years old. Yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. I seen some pretty fucked up movies before right. I was 10 years old too. Right. Yeah. And like that, Hellraiser. Right. There you go. There That's you go. That's a prime example right there. Or uh, my dad said that he, this movie scarred, his, scarred him as a kid. So he, he, wanted, he wanted to show me the movie too. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, Cannibal Holocaust. Oh, dude. Yeah. Oof. That, is, on, that is the deep end of the pool, my man. I grew up on a farm, so like we had to kill animals too. Sure. So sure. Kind, kind of showing that was more like a educational piece. Sure. Which is kind of fucked up to say, but it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's, I, I, I it's remember very controversial, the... but I. I I'm by okay. the way, I'm... by the way, you know who loves that film? Loves that film. Who's Steven that? Spielberg and Francis Ford Coppola. That's Both love that. Yeah. That's that's kind of not surprising, but pretty awesome to know. Yeah, yeah. Because because again, great filmmaking. Look, you know, Comes real filmmakers, real people outside who, the box. People who really love film, they they don't put horror or even extreme horror into a mm. box and go, "That's all crap." Yeah, it's you take each one and look at it for the merits of what that film gives you. Yep. And, you know, Diodato yeah. had like some incredible ideas and did some amazing things. Dude, the dude was 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 brought to was brought up on charges in Italy of mm -hmm. murdering those people. Yeah. Of making a snuff movie. He had yeah, to dude. produce the cast. <laughs> the cast had to show up in order for him to be <laughs> walk free. The crazy part is that movie was made, what, in the 70s? Yeah. And, and you watch it today, it looks like, just as you said earlier, like it, that it was shot, oh, shot yeah. yesterday. Okay. Yep, practical effects. Yeah. Practical. The, the the people that did the makeup and all the uh, uh, all the props, they made people really believe that those people died. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love practical effects. I yes. I, I did want to talk to you about one thing. Um, you did, sure. I did, it, that's in your in the documentary I've seen with you. Um, yeah. Like, as I got older, when I, when I was in, 
I grew up, I was born in the late seventies. I grew up in the eighties and that's usually when I did most of my horror watching. When sure. I got older, I got into other genres and I'm not so much into, I'm not a horror guy myself. Okay. You know, I like film noir, Western. So I like a lot of the awesome. classic Hollywood. Love and, it. um, and, uh, you do, and what you said kind of resonated with me. You said what you didn't like so much like with the newer movies is they have got kind of what well, what I interpreted as they've got kind of serious and mm-hmm. really dark, mm-hmm. and they kind of lost their camp and their comedy. And you did like comedy in your horror movies, and I, yeah. I agree with that. That's I think that maybe yeah. that's the well, something I, I feel like I lost from watching those movies. Sure, so, sure. Yeah. Yeah, everything's just gotten really um, look, and, and I, I I understand it. Um, there's a dourness in a lot of our horror now. There's a lot of sadness, um, where you know most of our horror movies, especially in the '80s, horror was a the bunch of, a bunch of kids go on a romp. And yep. there's sex and drugs and woohoo and it's a party and oh it's an no, ass and everything, yeah. There's a guy with a chainsaw. Oops. Um the Return of the song. Living Dead had it too. Oh, totally. 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 <laughs> totally. <laughs> when she's dancing on the grave and everything all nude. There's oh, just Dead Alive was great. Just, Oh, Dead Alive is amazing. amazing. <laughs> I love Dead Alive. Amazing yeah. film. I'm actually um, uh, Facebook friends with Beverly Randolph, who played the preppy girl in The Return of the Living Dead. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 It's, uh, no, I listen, kill for I'm, the Lord. I am all for, <laughs> I kick ass for the Lord. For the Lord. <laughs> yep. um, uh, it's, uh, no, it, look, I, I think that there is, uh, we've lost a certain sense of our fun. And play, yeah, and I think that's I agree. a huge a mistake. Seriousness. I think that's sad. I think that's sad. Um, and again, we're in, we're living in a serious world, man. And and as I, you know, as I said earlier, you know, when 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 the industry itself has to police itself, which we do have to, we do, we de- we need to police ourselves. Yeah. Um, when when people have to be held accountable for some really shitty behavior, oh sh- um, yes, it 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 does start to darken everything around all of us you know Mm -hmm. that said i am all for some fun giddy silly over the top great filmmaking that treats the audience like hey why don't you come in and have a good time like zombie land Yep. Totally. Well, look, but you know what? I, I, and and again, I, it's funny. We we you guys brought up the Flash earlier. Yeah. What I what I liked about the Flash, what I thought was good about the Flash, was that here's a movie that's fun. Like yes, it, it didn't is. take itself too seriously. Mm-mm. Nope. Where I look at the Snyder movies of the DCU, and I yeah. go, "Whew, man, this is heavy. heavy. This it is, is heavy. Really heavy. Great Scott. And, and heavy's yeah. fine sometimes. Like I get it." Um, I was just rewatching Prisoners this afternoon. The- oh, oh, I love that movie. An Great amazing movie. film. So I love a good dark movie every once in a while, but purpose, man. Yeah. But not all have- the time, of course. No, I got to yeah. have a little Ted Lasso in my life. Like a little. <laughs> I agree with that. Like, let's have some fun. You know? I actually have a good question for you because John, myself, and of course, Sebastian at the bottom, we're all physical media collectors. Like, are you a supporter of physical media or digital or no, no, no. like both? Dude, dude, I I I have in this house uh there are twenty six thousand movies. Oh shit. Wow. That's beautiful. <laughs> then so, I should hook yeah. you up with uh films at home. His name's Jeff. He huh? love he has his own podcast that's directly like supportive for physical media. Oh well I love that. I love that. I am a huge, huge fan of, okay. of, of physical media. No, no, no. I'll have I'm, to hit him up. All, I'm all about that. All about that. So awesome. Um, no, I'm 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 a physical media guy. All of our films, everything Skeleton Crew makes, we do physical media of every single one. So cool. We are big believers. Yeah. That's great. I know because like Netflix and certain other streaming services don't do the physical media so much. By the There's way, that. it's why it's why we are in this fight right now. For, yeah, uh, we're on strike. It's literally why we're on strike. Hey guys, I just want to say I have to head out. I have a okay. birthday dinner to go to. It was my birthday I do too, yesterday. Actually. I do too. Actually, happy birthday! It was my birthday yesterday. Yeah, happy so. birthday, hey, man! Happy birthday, dude! That's Thank awesome. You. I finally joined the thirties club, so <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll be nice forty next you. year. Nice Woo. to have you. Um, but it's Thank it was lovely meeting you, brother. And likewise, yeah, and looking forward to seeing your next movies. Yes, that's for sure. 
And it was a pleasure meeting you, sir. You too. Have a Thanks nice for stopping night, by. See you, see Bass. Have a good night, everybody. See, see ya. Yeah, we usually do this stream uh, like two hours, but it depends on your time frame of when and if you're able to and all that kind of stuff. Like Diane, apparently she does charge for um, her appearance. So oh, okay. we well, were, I, I was only able to get an hour with her. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 But I, she was worth it. She's amazing. Yeah. She's awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. She's great. Wish Very we nice. to see more of her in her younger years. I mm -hmm. wish she had become more of a prominent actor. She was, I mean, she was in the eighties, but then she kind of, yeah, yeah. away well, in the nineties. You know, our industry, our industry is not kind to women after they reach a certain age. Never yeah, ever. I get Never that. Ever. Yeah, it's, it's funny because now, but it's yeah. it's it's always been rough. Oh, definitely, because Jamie Lee is still, you know, oh, yeah. Hell yeah, doing movies. So I don't see why she couldn't come back and do something like I made a suggestion because she was talking about like maybe having a convention where Keanu Reeves comes back to like sure. reunite with the cast at a Comic Con or some sort or whatever. Sure. Sure. And then I made the suggestion, well, why not be in the next John Wick that they're planning on doing? She could be what a French spy. Love it. Well, there's something to be said about that, I guess, in Sunset Boulevard, obviously. Sure. That's probably one of my favorite movies. It's uh, a great Billy film. Wilder. Yeah. Great film. Great yeah. film. Yeah. Oh, Billy yeah. Wilder was also Billy kind Wilder of. Fan. Huge fan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. definitely. Uh, were you a fan yeah. of Killer Clowns from Outer Space? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm always yeah. curious on that one because I, I mean, don't get me wrong, it has a big following, but. Oh. I'm sure there's some people that don't really care for it. So sure, but uh, but again, <laughs> Liz, hey, you know, I made Jason goes to hell for God's sakes. Uh, I, I I am I am made of Teflon about stuff like this, and it's like for me, um, there's plenty of movies that I don't like or that I thought weren't great movies. Yeah, I never I never find anyone's opinion of any of them wrong. You know, it's like, no, mm -hmm. man, you got to, that's the, the love of film is that we all have different opinions and we're all oh, yeah. going to talk about it and debate it. And that's the best part of movies is being able to okay. kind of have a knockdown drag out with your friends over a movie that you loved and they hated or, the, or vice versa. Oh, I, yeah. I think that's one of the great things about film. Well, I know that really? there was talks of a second Killer Clowns in yeah. general. How would you feel about that? And maybe you direct or something like that. Well, dude, look, I think, I think, I think that that's easily a franchise that could have had more life without a doubt. Oh yeah, so, definitely. Yeah. No, I mean, it's uh, uh, no, I think it's, I think it would be actually a great idea and it's a good piece of IP. Everybody knows that movie. Okay. Especially with practical are effects. You, are you needing to get out of here? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I gotta, yeah, I gotta, I gotta wrap it up. Okay. Um, I, I just seen your private chat there. No worries. No worries, man. Not, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah, guys, no. If, if we got to get going, that's totally fine. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. I appreciate that. I guys. just, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I like your your thing about the about the safe sex and the that whole uh, message you put in the movie. Yep. Yeah, I wouldn't unsafe I wouldn't sex shoot kills. <laughs> I wouldn't shoot. I wouldn't shoot the scene without. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, they wanted me to do a, a, you know, a sex equals death scene. And I was like, I won't do it. I just will not put that in my movie. I, I, I think that's a terrible thing to tell young people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having sex is going to kill them. However, if you're unsafe, oh, well, no, that'll kill you. So no, okay. definitely. And it was great because every time the movie would play in an audience, the minute you would see her throw the condom away, everyone in the theater would be like, oh, because you just do. <laughs> like, that's that. that. There's their death sentence. They're done. Yeah. Well, Adam, thank you very much for joining us, man. I mean, oh, it, it was a pleasure to have you on. My pleasure, guys. You guys were awesome. Yeah. And I like that we were able to like debate other subjects rather than just film. Oh, that yeah. Amazing. Well, because we're movie we're moviegoers, you know, and we want to know anything and everything we can, of course, but we're also human beings. I love so you. we yeah. would we would rather treat you as a human than like say a statue. I love yeah. it. I love it, guys. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Yeah, thank you again, and everybody cool. have a good night. Absolutely. And See everybody stay later. safe. Good night, y'all. Good night. See ya. Later.